and we have a really special treat for us today. Uh, one of our elders, uh, Tim Hall, is going to come and give us the message. Good morning. Well, this is the last sermon in the series, I Value You. And it's been a really fun series, and it's been very, very wonderful to go back again and hear those wonderful truths that are true for you and me. Uh, truths such as 2 Corinthians 5.17. There is therefore, or therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Or um, Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then a couple weeks ago, Lynn talked about, he, he started the sermon, and the first thing he said is, does God tolerate you, or does he love you and accept you as a daughter and a son? And those are fabulous truths, and if you're new in the faith, hopefully they have brought a smile to your face, and you rejoice because they're your truths. And if you're old like me in the faith, hopefully we can get assurance and joy and conviction again that these are true for us. Um, and the purpose of this series was to get us to think God's thoughts after him, to think the way God thinks about us. If we can do that, that would be a transformation in our lives. Pastor Lynn said several times when he quoted his favorite verse, at least for this season of his life, 1 Corinthians 4, 3, uh, he said something like this, and I quote, he says, it is more important for me to know what God thinks about me than what anyone else thinks about me, even myself. When I believe about myself what God believes about me, I will be changed. So Len just gave you a formula. Uh, the formula he gave you was Truth plus faith equals transformation. Is that true? Truth plus faith equals change, transformation in our lives? Yeah, it's true. Uh, truth is the engine. Um, faith is the gas. And you put gas in the engine, and the engine goes. And you can make progress and you can transform. However, I want to give you a little secret. That short formula, truth plus faith equals transformation, doesn't work for me. It's true, but it doesn't work for me. And it may not work for you either. I need a longer formula, I need more ingredients. Maybe it's because I'm slow, I don't know. But it's more for me like truth plus faith plus blank and maybe even another blank equals transformation. But I know it's truth plus faith plus blank equals tra transformation for me. And I think the reason why it's that way for me and maybe it's that way for you is because we don't fight right. We don't understand, really, I don't think, that we are in a vicious battle right now, and that battle has never, ever stopped since we've come to Christ. We are in a guerrilla warfare, jungle tactic, behind the vines, in the mud, shooting laser darts at one another, and sometimes we don't realize the intensity of the battle that we are in. And we don't fight right. We don't perceive the intensity and the scale of war that we are fighting. And so we need to know how to fight correctly. And if we don't, we'll probably lose. 
and we probably won't enter in to that transformative relationship that God wants for us. So if you would look at my favorite passage of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, this is the formula that Paul gives to us so that we, as believers in Christ Jesus, can fight correctly in this battle that we're in. It says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ so that uh, we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. If we can understand that, truth plus faith plus this will give us transformation. It's no coincidence that uh, um, Len's favorite verse for this season and this um, verse that I'm quoting you comes from the book of Corinthians because the Corinthians were not living in transformation. Paul calls them fat babies in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2 uh, verses, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1. They are still living immature baby type of Christian lives and they're not living in transformation and they don't even realize that they're being attacked. Uh, we need to realize that Satan wants to kill us if he can. And if God doesn't block him, he will. That's his purpose, is to take us out. And if Satan doesn't take us out, he wants to make it so rough for us down here that the only thing we can do is disengage and become passive. Because if we're passive and we disengage and we, we refuse to fight anymore, he's virtually won anyway. And so that's Satan's tactic. And we've talked uh, several times. Um, he uses the unholy trinity, we've said. He uses the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, um, uh, let's take the devil first. The devil's go-to tactic for you and for me is that he wants to deceive you. And deception is his primary thing that he wants to do. He wants to fill you with doubts and lies and distortions to the point where you don't even believe God anymore. Isn't that what he did with Eve in the garden? He came to her with doubts. Did God say? God knew that if you ate the tree, you'd be illumined. That's an audacious lie. And Eve takes her eyes off of Jesus and places them on to Satan. And Satan slices her, dices her, cubes her, puts her in the deep fryer, lets her dry, cellophanes her, wraps her up, puts thick paper on her, sticks her in the freezer, and basically after that she disengages because she's deceived. And it wasn't even a fair fight. And she didn't realize it. And that's what's happening to us. And we need to realize that we are in a vicious battle and the serpent wants to deceive us and he will do whatever he can to do that. It's funny that uh, the Corinthian church, after Paul visited them, he left. And soon after he visited them, there came a group from Jerusalem called the Super Apostles. And these Super Apostles were Judaizers. They were saying that, yeah, faith is important. Paul's right. You need to believe in God. But you need to be circumcised. And you need to follow the Old Testament letter. And you need to do this and this and this and this. And then you can have the assurance of salvation. And they were teaching heresy. And they came into the church of Corinth and they spent a, a several months there and they polluted the Corinthians so much that the Corinthians 
didn't even know what to believe. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, it says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Satan, if he can directly attack you, he will. And if he can, he will use deception. And if you're not on your toes and you don't understand the truth of God's word, he is going to put you in the freezer. And he's going to do it quicker and smoother than you ever believed, just like he did to the Corinthians. The super apostles deceptively presented a different gospel, and the Corinthians weren't even mature enough five years, six years on from their faith, and they didn't even realize it. They were packaged and taped up before they even knew it hit them. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, Paul says, Brethren, don't be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. And that's the other ingredient. Faith plus truth plus proper thinking equals transformation. We need to know how to think when Satan comes in and directly confronts us. And if Satan doesn't use uh, a direct attack with his demons or himself, then he uses the flesh. And the flesh wants to tie us in knots as well. And what is the major modus operandi of the flesh? Well, the flesh wants to divide you. And it wants to make the vision the most important thing in terms of how it defeats you. If you look at Galatians 5, 16 and 17, it says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. These two are in opposition so that you will not do the things that you please or to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Um, Satan uses the flesh to divide us, uh, to make us... Um, um, two groups instead of one. And um, we need to realize that. As I quoted earlier, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2, the Corinthians uh, were, were children, were babies. It says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you're still in the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh behaving only in human ways? And so the flesh comes at us each and every day, and it comes at us to divide us. The super apostles of Paul's era, they came from Jerusalem, and they were completely devoted to divide the Corinthian church and to get them to follow them instead of the Apostle Paul. And they did it. And um, they discredited Paul, and they distorted Paul's words, and they did whatever they could to diminish Paul and divide the Corinthians from Paul so that they would have their mind. And they did it. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the same chapter where our text is, there are several verses that just shows you what the Corinthians believed and what the 
um, what the super apostles, these holy Joes, tried to convince the Corinthians to believe. If you look at verse 2 at the end, uh, they, they taught and the Corinthians started to believe that Paul was walking in the flesh himself. The greatest apostle on the face of the earth, they said, is walking in the flesh. And then if you look at uh, verse 7, if you read it and you intently look at it, they're saying that G Paul isn't even a follower of Jesus Christ. He doesn't even know the Savior. Uh, and they are, they are beating Paul up and discrediting his message. And then if you look at verse 10, they say, For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive. He's a weakling. He has bowed legs. He has uh, frizzy hair. He, he's slight. He, he stinks. And his speech is contemptible. I mean, he's not an eloquent speaker like the super apostles. He doesn't dress like success like these holy Joes do. And all they do is discredit Paul and tear him down and try to get the Corinthians to be divided from him because they know in reality that Paul is speaking the truth. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3, he says... Uh, and let me quote it here because it's, it's really important. 1 Corinthians 4, 3, he says, But to me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you. Paul says, I don't take any time to be examined by the Corinthians, nor do I take any time to be examined by these super apostles. And I don't take any time to be examined by any human court. Because you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to divide me, and they're speaking lies, and they're trying to rip me down, and I don't listen to that babble. It's not worth my effort. And then he says, I don't even examine myself, because I know that in my mind, my mind half the time is controlled by the lousy flesh, and the flesh itself in my mind is trying to deceive me and trying to divide me. And Paul knows that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, and so he doesn't even judge himself. The only one he allows to judge him is God. Because God is the only one, brothers, sisters, that speaks truth. So don't listen to your head. It's filled with deception and division. And don't listen to others who try to be spiritual, but they're not. You ever get two groups of people, sooner or later you'll get division. You ever get people together, there's going to be some type of division because somebody's going to be chapped off and filled with the flesh and try to divide you. And we shouldn't even listen to that because that does not create health and transformation. What it does is it causes a double-minded spirit and it wraps us up and ties us up and causes us to disengage. And it's not what the Lord wants for us. It's not his will at all. And then there's the world. Satan uses the world to defeat us. And what does Satan do with the world? The world's modus operandi is to delude us. Let me give you an example. 241 years ago, the United States became an independent republic from England. At that time, I am convinced and I know that the majority of the citizens at that time believed that God created the world in seven days. Uh, they believed in biblical authority that the word of God was inerrant, inviolate, inviolable, immutable, uh, totally, um, totally right and just for faith and practice. Um, they believed the truth was absolute. There's a right and there's a wrong. And they believed that adultery, fornication, homosexuality were wrong and grievous sins and were to be avoided. 240 years later, today in our society, the world, we believe, the majority of the people believe in society, that the world was created by a scientific process called evolution, which started at the Big Bang. 
Um, the majority of people believe that the Bible is filled with errors, and it depends on how you interpret it. And if you interpret it your way, that's fine. I will interpret it my way. The world today believes that truth is relative. It may be good for you not to have premaritable sex, but for me, it's fine. So it's relative, and that's fine. We can live that way. Adultery, fornication, and homosexuality are lifestyle choices that the individual chooses based on his or her own personal convictions. What's changed in 241 years? Has the Bible changed? Truth? Commandments of Scripture? None of that has changed. But each and every day, we are being bammed and hit and crushed by the world that tries to delude us each and every day and it shapes our values, and it crumbles our beliefs, and it squeezes us into his mold, as Romans 12, 2 in the Phillips translation says. And Satan uses the world to progressively and to slowly change the way we think. And we don't even know it half the time. We're like the frog in the kettle that's being boiled to death because the heat is rising and it's so subtle and it's so soft and it's guerrilla warfare and we're being squeezed and, uh, and we're getting to the point where we're starting to choke. And that's what Satan tries to do. And we need to know how to fight right. And that's what we need to have for victory. Truth plus faith plus proper thinking equals transformation and that's what we need to really concentrate on in everything that we do so if you look at second corinthians chapter 10 3 again it says even though we are in the flesh that just means that you and i have earth suits uh, we all have the same earth suits and those earth suits are stained with sin we have sin inside of us we don't want that but we do and we have mind, flesh, we have a will, we have sexual appetites, and we're all in the flesh. But we don't war against the flesh. If we want to win against Satan, we don't war with fleshly instruments or fleshly armor. Uh, the word for war in, this, uh, in the original means uh, strategy comes from the Greek uh, stratomai, which means that we have a better strategy than just using what the flesh uses. And what does the flesh use? Oh, jealousy, strife. Uh, married people, when they're together, they discredit one another. Uh, they interpret things negatively. Uh, that's of the flesh. Strife, distortions, arrogance, gossip, subtle deception, bald-faced lying. These are all of the flesh. And I imagine when Paul is writing this, he's a little frustrated with the Corinthian church because that's how they're fighting. And they're fighting just like little children, like fat babies. And um, he's frustrated with that. And he says that the weapons we use are spiritual, spiritually powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Well, for a, a, a list of the weapons, we can go to Ephesians chapter 6. And Ephesians 6, from 14 on, uh, Paul gives us five weapons. And it's interesting, the five weapons he gives us. Four of them cover our body completely. Um, one is um, we're, we have the loin of truth. Those are thick Middle thick leather belts that went around the soldier's waist. And Paul says, that's the loin of truth. Truth is what covers us in our intimate parts. And then we have the breastplate of righteousness. That was a thick piece of leather, leather from the shoulders to the waist or cha chain mail from the shoulders to the waist. 
that protected them, and that was the truth of righteousness. Righteous teaching is correct application of truth. And then we have our shoes shod, the hobnail sandals are shod, and that's the preparation of the gospel of peace. And what is the message of salvation? It's precepts and prepositions, uh, propositions of the truth. And then we have the helmet of salvation, and that covers our head. And what's the most important thing we can know? That we're saved. That we're saved. John 5, 24, that was one of the I value statements. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he, hear, who, he, he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life and will not come into condemnation. And that's on our head. So our whole body of defensive weapon is the truth. It covers us from the tip of our toe to the top of our head. We are covered in truth. And then we have the word of truth, which is the sword, and that's the offensive weapon that we attack one another with, not viciously, but if they throw a lie in our way, we can, we can attack it. And then, you know, it's, it's interesting, we have the shield of faith, and the faith extinguishes all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And there's the formula. There's the short formula. Truth covers us from head to toe. Faith, truth plus faith equals transformation. But it comes in the context here. Truth plus faith plus proper thinking. I need to believe it for me. If I allow doubt to set in, I don't have truth plus faith anymore. Those truths have to be true for me, and they have to be true for you. And if they're true for you, and you believe them, then God is going to bless you. Doesn't it say in Hebrews eleven six? but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It's my truth. That's what liberates me when I believe it's mine, proper thinking. And that's extremely important. And then it's interesting. He says that, um, that these weapons, they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. That's an interesting concept because when you think of fortresses in the Old Testament, a fortress is a positive thing. In the book of Psalms, God is our fortress. He's our high tower. He's our buckler. He's our shield. He is, he is the place of safe hiding. When we're being bombarded, we run into God and we're safe there. And why is that? Because God is true. And I imagine uh, the castle of God or the fortress of God and all those stones in the castle and fortress of God represent who God is. Mercy, grace, righteousness, kindness, victory in Jesus. And the, those stones, uh, the mortar of those stones is faith. So faith plus truth is my safe place and God's my safe place. But in this text, um, a fortress is used as a negative thing. And it's a fortress that Satan builds in our minds. And so the stones and the, the structure that in, is in our minds isn't a safe place. It's a place that hinders us. And it's an obstacle. And it restricts and binds the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can have free movement in our minds. And every time we believe a lie or a distortion or any stinking type of thinking then there's a stone that's laid in our minds by Satan. And after one deception, one distortion, and envy and strife, pretty soon in our, big, our head, we have a giant castle. And the stones of that castle are deception, lies, misdeeds, divisions, delusions, 
everything that's a part of Satan. And the mortar around those stones is doubt. You see, faith and, uh, and doubt are dynamic. And if you feed faith, you walk in a safe place. And if you feed doubt, you have an obstacle in your head. You have a, a huge castle in your head. And the Holy Spirit cannot move and have its being. Um, if you look at the city of Florence, for example, or the city of Corinth, for example, it was, um, it was the city that um, um, Paul visited. And uh, this is the city, the ancient city. There's a new city a little bit closer to the water. But you drive down and you go right by that Acropolis, that mountain. That's the high place. And if you look to the right, you'll see just a little flat thing. Well, that's the existing fortress. That used to be a fortress. So every time Paul said, you have a fortress in your minds, the Corinthians knew exactly what Paul was talking about. This is the fortress we have in our minds. It's, it's huge. And, and, and it is filled with lies and deceptive thinking by Satan. And they knew exactly what Paul was saying when he says, you have a big fortress in your minds. And the only way that you can destroy the stones and the bricks and the things that are involved in a fortress is to pull it down. That is the only way. And uh, we need to pull down those things all the time because we know that truth plus faith plus biblical thinking equals transformation. You see, we can beat every lie with the truth. Say that with me. We can beat every lie with the truth. And we can overcome every, what did I say? It's, uh, if you advance the slide for me. We can overcome every lie and distortion with biblical faith. So let's say this phrase again. We can beat every lie with the truth and overcome every doubt by biblical faith. Amen? The truth, practical thinking, godly thinking fits into the equation and gives us the victory that we are looking for. And then it's interesting, Paul states uh, two statements in here. He says, um, we are destroying speculation and every lofty thought raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Those two statements are almost identical. They're real similar. You take one thought, you lift it up to the knowledge of God, and you take another thought captive to um, to the mind of Christ. It's interesting that word captive means to capture with a spear. And uh, Paul is saying that every time there's a negative thought in my mind, I capture with a spear. It's, it's the idea that a soldier tried to throw the spear in the back of, of his adversary because he's not covered in the back. And they didn't have the rules of engagement that we have. And they know that if they could hit that guy with a spear in the back, that would immediately paralyze the guy. You've, you've been hit in the back. The first thing you do is go like this. Ha! I mean, you're, 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 you're stuck. And the, so that spear's in your back, and then the soldier can just grab that spear, and he can take that adversary wherever he wants because that, uh, that adversary has been captured. And that's what we're supposed to do with our thoughts. We're supposed to capture our thoughts, paralyze them. And that's the first part of the sequence. We catch our thought. So every time you have a disturbing thought in your mind, you're anxious, you're torn, you're frustrated, you're believing a lie, first thing, you capture that thing. And it's in the pro progressive present in the Greek. It means that I do it all the time. I never stop doing it. And we never stop capturing our thoughts. Satan lays a brick, we capture it, pull it down. Satan lays another brick, before it's even there and before the mortar's on it, 
We grab that thing and we pull it down. That's the attitude. We capture that. And so the sequence is we capture the thought, we bring it to the light, and we raise it up. And what's the light? The light is the truth. And we bring it to the light and we raise it up and we see that the, the, this stone that we have in our head is dark, it's filthy, it's filled with deception and it cannot stand up against the light and then we throw it out and we leave the truth in its place. So I capture the thought, I lift it up to the truth. If it's false, I throw it out and I let the truth bathe me with its pure light. You know, when I was in Italy... I would go to the post office. And uh, you do everything at the post office in Italy. You even buy groceries there. I mean, you bank there. You send the money wires. You, once in a while, you mail a letter, a letter. But most of the time at the post office, you do other things. Well, I had a whole bunch of bills to pay at the post office. And I came in and I gave the postal clerk 500 euro. That's one bill, and that's worth about $675. So if you lose one of those, it ruins your life for a couple months. And uh, you don't want to do that. So I handed him the 500-euro note, and the first thing he kind of did was he kind of caught it. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, this guy here, he's an expert in counterfeit money. He knows everything about counterfeit money. And I'm told that those who know a lot about counterfeit money, they don't study the counterfeits. They just study the truth. And if they know the truth so well that whenever there's a counterfeit present, they can, they can identify it with, with ease because they know the truth. And that's what we're supposed to know. We're supposed to know the truth so well that whenever Satan sows a seed of doubt through division, delusion, or through any other means, we can understand it. So he catches that 500 euro and he kind of touches it and feels it, feels good to him. He raises it to the light, first thing he does. He sees that there's a metal strip going vertical down it. He sees that there's two water marks, one on this page and one on the other side, and they are faces of people, but you can't see them unless you see them in the light. And then he, he sees these holograms and when you shake them and move them, they change faces on you in colors. And those look all right. And he sees it both sides. And so it looks pretty good. And he puts it down on his desk. And he takes a little Q-tip thing. And he puts it in, I think it's water. It might be in another chemical substance. And he, he puts it and he wets it. And he puts it on, on the bill. And he, he rubs it in the bill. And then he has a piece of clean scratch paper to the side and he takes that q-tip and he rubs it and it bleeds purple because the euro bill is purple and he goes it's good puts it in the till hands me my change and that's what we're supposed to do whenever there's a, a thought that comes from satan and he puts it in our mind as a big stone or three or four stones first thing we do is we catch that thing and we raise it up in the light and we know the truth so well that it shows the shadows of that hideous thought and, and the truth washes that thought with purity and cleanness and we throw it out and we let the truth stand in our hearts. That's why we talked about God values you is because we want you to know it and to believe it and to use proper thinking to make it yours. That's why it's a big difference. That's why it makes a big difference. It's all the difference in the world when we think faith plus truth, excuse me, truth plus faith plus biblical thinking equals transformation I can, I can beat every lie with the truth and I can overcome every insidious doubt with biblical faith I have to believe it and I have to think it and if we do that it might not happen overnight 
but it's going to happen. You're going to see transformation. Amen? Greater error here. That's why we're here. We don't come just to hang out. We come so that God can transform us, to change us. And so as, as Tim has opened up the word, if God has brought something to your mind, maybe there's some stinking thinking as he referred to it going on. I would encourage you to take some time and uh, as we prepare ourselves to give the offering and uh, for God to receive from us those gifts, uh, think about those things and invite him to do that work in you. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful that you have entrusted to us your many gifts and your many blessings. And we acknowledge right now that everything we have has been given to us by you. And so we give back to you freely. We give back to you with a, a smile on our face and, and joy in our hearts because we, we love you and we want to honor you. So receive these gifts from us, Lord. and May they be used to extend your kingdom work in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, come forward.